Well, the page is still up there. Yes, a miracle yes. thing, so. so you have these cute so little things for this big Good morning. How are you? Are you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm back. Uh, yeah. so they're, they're called pot marrow. It's a very temperamental system. system. But I think I figured it out. She says before the whole thing yeah. starts. <laughs> right. Or, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so we're going to get started. Um, and um, you're, you're going to hear confessions along the way from me. And my editor is in the back, um, a specialist in uh, Old Testament theology and, um, and scripture. Uh, but we're going to talk about governance in Israel. And the reason we're doing that this week is because one of the conundrums that I have had is, um, this is always so interesting, yeah. I feel like I should do it. <laughs> um, uh, one of the conundrums I've had um, is figuring out how to distinguish different kinds of leadership in the Old Testament. So this, um, this particular forum is going to be more of a, what does the inside of Lori's brain work like? Um, <laughs> Uh, then it is going to be um, giving you lots and lots of information, okay? But I think that it will be helpful to you because I'm guessing that you may have discovered some of the same impediments as you were reading through scripture that I have, like references to purity laws and to moral codes that had not been established before the law came down from Sinai and things like that. So, um, like, wait a minute, how are we talking about laws when there is no law that's come down the mountain, right? Things like that, that are kind of this chicken and egg question. And, um, but, but we're also going to spend some time um, associating uh, government and leadership and, um, and also times when there was no room for, for Israel to govern itself because it did not have the power to. Um, and, and we are aware of some of those periods, but they are many. So, um, <laughs> this is the first thing I'm going to start you with, um, is a picture of a guy looking really shocked um, and wearing glasses. Uh -huh. And the definition below is a, a word that, um, that theologians use, that scripture, um, that teachers of scripture use regularly, which is one that you will probably not use unless you have it within a different context, like maybe medicine or something like that. The word is hermeneutics, and it is plural. Um, it means the study of methodological principles of interpretation. I put the picture of the guy up there with the glasses because the way I explain it is it's the lens through which we see things, okay? So all of us have interpretive tools that we work with. We just don't necessarily pay attention to them, right? So a good example of that is um, some people read scripture um, literally. That means um, that they think that every word that comes from the Hebrew Testament is a command that they need to adhere to. Um, However, as we may be aware, um, easier said than done, right? Um, and some of those commandments are in conflict with the teachings of Christ, which means that over the years, what the church has done as they have listened to Christ's teachings is that we begin to interpret Scripture through Christ size, okay? Um, the other hermeneutics that is regularly used uh, by the church, I would say predominantly the mainline church, is the um, historical critical method. And you may only have heard that in passing before, but it's very much, in my mind, linked to the the revised standard version of the Bible that came out in 1957, which began to give us footnotes about when certain biblical documents were found, and those were related to 
available um, in their original form. But one of the things that we have discovered is that there might be several original forms, right? So which one are we working from? So the historical critical method is a lens for seeing um, into scripture. Um, I'm going to explain it to you in nickel terms by telling you a story. And that has to do with the two um, colored pictures that are up there. When I was in Israel in 2009, um, we, we stayed in the old city of Jerusalem for three or four days. And walked through the Arab quarter and it was always fascinating, first of all, to see pigs with no heads hanging upside down in yeah. the window for sale, mm -hmm. yummy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but there were spice shops all over. Mm -hmm. And they did the most amazing art yeah. with spices. And one of the ones that I remember, it was not a pyramid like this. This is a pyramid of spices over here, okay? Mm -hmm. It was a pyramid that actually layered the spices one layer at a time up to a point, okay? And my first thought when I thought saw it, other than, wow, that's amazing, was, that's so impractical. How are you going to get the spices down at the <laughs> bottom, right? And as soon as you get the ones down at the bottom, what happens? Everything else caves in, right? So, um, so uh, you know, this is the neat orderly way of doing spices, right? is you have them all sorted out and we know exactly what we're getting when we scoop into one of those bowls. Um, this way, beautiful, artistic, but as soon as you put a spoon in it, you've got a whole bunch of spices and distinguishing one from the other and sorting them out is really hard. I have now introduced the Old Testament to you. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's the Old Testament? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's much more this. Yeah. Um, so, many of you have been introduced um, by Edwin, if not Pastor Kate, um, to uh, various books within the Hebrew Testament. Um, in case you didn't catch on to this, the Old Testament actually is its own mm -hmm. anthology of books, uh, apart from the Christian <coughs> Testament. Uh, we just call that whole collection with the Christian Testament the Holy Bible. But the Hebrew Bible is what you would find in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Um, that what, what you may have learned along the way is that um, when the people, and this speaks to one of the periods where the people of Israel were governed, um, when the people were in Babylonian captivity, this is the leaders uh, of the people were marched out of Judah into Babylon. Um, they, uh, they were there for 60 years. And um, thereabouts, right? Some of them stayed, some of them went home after that. But, um, but they began to look around and realize that when you are dislocated, or relocated as the case may be, um, you don't get to bring all of your stories with you because not all the people who tell the stories are around. And you better start doing some preservation of the stories of God's people, and especially if the way that, that those stories have been communicated is orally, you've got a whole lot more work on your hands, right? So, um, so it was during that period that the first five books of the Hebrew Testament were set to writing. Um, that is a long <coughs> time into the history of God's people from the time, well, certainly of creation, but more particularly from the time that God put his arm around Abraham's shoulder and said, hey, I have an idea. Let's take you out of this land and I'll give you a land of your own. Okay? So, so there's a lot of time that has passed between 
um, the time that the covenant is made with Abraham and the time that the people find themselves in uh, captivity in Babylon. And the voices, they are ed regularly educated people who were marched out of, um, relocated from Israel. They, you know, you, if you take the brightest and the best, you kind of defeat a people in, in several ways, right? Uh, and maybe gain something for your own culture. Um, but um, they start to think about how they're going to put together in writing what um, has already been spoken for generations. Um, who gets to write that is the question. And the answer, especially um, from a Jewish perspective, is we need a lot of voices to write this. Um, and guess what? Not all those voices are going to agree. Not all of them are going to remember the story the exact same way that the other folks remember it. Which means that you're going to have not this effect, but this yeah. effect. Okay? Okay. So, um, first thing we need to take into consideration, um, starting with the covenant of Abraham. This is Abraham looking up at the stars and remembering God's promise, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, is that the... Um, the people of God begin as the Hebrew people um, who, uh, who really are clans of families, right? Um, and um, the, the, um, the, the government of those people depends on a patriarchal culture. Uh, we know that the matriarchs uh, got a few words in, but the history that we hear clearly is from the patriarch's perspective, too. Um, so, so what we have, because God is inviting Abraham to move from Ur um, and Haran uh, to this new land, Canaan, is nomadic people. Um, what do you know about um, nomadic existence versus agrarian existence. What is enabled by having agrarian society? Fear. Fear. <laughs> <laughs> An important thing, yes. Cities, settlements. Cities, settlements, civilization, right? Um, so, and the place from which Abraham comes is one of those places that is a seabed for civilization, right? But if you're on the move, the people who are governing you are yourselves. Um, now, there might be tribes around you that are going to affect your choices, um, and um, with <coughs> conflict. Um, but that nomadic existence means that doing anything that we would consider uh, formal government is not going to happen, right? Um, so, so here's, here's a, a, an example of the spices getting mixed up, okay? Um, how many of you know the story of Tamar in Genesis? Tamar um, gets married, and what happens? Husband dies. Husband dies. What, what happens to her? Is she a widow shunned? Or is there a plan, a safety net for her? It's a plan of succession. You're going to marry the brother or somebody hey, else. Okay, so there's, family. somehow there's this understanding that if you, um, if you are widowed in a family and there is another brother for you to be married to, there is an obligation for you as the brother of the deceased man to marry the woman who is widowed. Um, where did that idea come from? 
<laughs> yeah, well, the men in this story don't particularly think it's a blessing because they keep dying. Uh, and at a certain point, we get this really sordid story about Tamar disguising herself as a prostitute so that she can go to her father-in-law, Judah, and become pregnant. Um, weird stuff, right? But this succession plan of Tamar moving from one, um, one son in the family to another is what later becomes known as Leverate Law. Do they name it that way in Genesis? No. But they're practicing it. So, did they have the rule then? <laughs> Or do the storytellers who put together this history from way back when know that that's the way things work in their time, right? Okay? Are you totally confused yet? <laughs> Is that something that was also being practiced then in like Ur and Haran before they started doing the Semitic? Yeah, there are, there are <laughs> other cultural examples of this. One thing that I would point out that was unique about God's people was because the way that the covenant was tied to family relationships made this reality even more important. So, so this is about not intermingling with other tribes yes, and staying family. pure? It, it's definitely by Ezra and Nehemiah's day was definitely viewed that, depending on how you, you read your mix of spice, it could have been an issue even before that or not. Right. Yeah. So, so the origins of these practices, and of course, I mean, one of the truths is people know that there are certain ways that they're going to get along in life, but we don't necessarily have a law that accompanies that behavior, right? So, so there are a couple of ways that you can think about these, um, th this sort of uh, law that is... Uh, part of the laws of, is it the laws of creation, or is it the law of God? Okay, okay. Um, we're going to move real fast to, um, from Genesis to Exodus, uh, because there's <coughs> lots of governing to get through, and um, for the next four books of the Pentateuch, we have Moses as the main guy, right? Um, there are other people who do have uh, who do take kind of second fiddle to Moses, but um, but Moses is the main character through these um, through these books. Um, but who's governing while Moses is around? Pharaoh, Pharaoh is right, and um, and it is only I mean it's it's an interesting happenstance that we hear about Moses being raised within the governing household. Um, and then being called. So um, that's an interesting statement about called, isn't it? That sometimes it's your life circumstances that may actually prepare you for the call that you are drawn to. Now, Moses didn't say when he was uh, taken in by Pharaoh's daughter, you know, someday I'm going to be a liberator. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, and I'm sure that Zelensky didn't say that either when he was on Dancing with the Stars. You know? <laughs> so, um, but but that, those are the circumstances that raise him into leadership. So, so you have a formal government that the Hebrew people have been under for 430 years, and you have people rising up within that government to claim freedom for a people. Um, gosh, you know, think about the, the wall going down in Berlin and the, the claim of independence that happens and then the really hard work of beginning to develop leaders and uh, infrastructure to make government work. Um, the, that, that is a long time coming for Moses and his people, right? Um, so Moses is given several titles, and titles are often helpful to discovering how um, people are governed. Um, uh, Moses really acts as a prophet to Pharaoh, telling him 
about God being in charge and not uh, Pharaoh. Um, he acts as an intermediary uh, between, uh, which, which actually could be interchangeable with priest uh, within the Hebrew Testament. Um, but he is the spokesperson. That's the way that God's people hear um, what, what uh, they need to do and where they need to go. And when they are not happy with the instructions, they go to Moses, not to God. Okay? Um, he's also understood to be a priest. There's actually a, a, a whole um, video that's been done on the <coughs> royal priesthood uh, by the Bible Project that is kind of beyond me because the, the allusions to priesthood, to a royal priesthood, this early in scripture, um, kind of, uh, I, I kind of missed those. But um, there, the, um, the covenant with Moses uh, of the law is only part of his relationship to God because we know that the, the relationship is not just about law and abiding by certain rules, but it's also about relationship between God and Moses, but God and God's people, right? Um, the law basically is summed up, as Jesus says, in love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. So Moses is the, the arbiter of that. Um, he and his brother Aaron are, even before they leave um, Egypt, uh, the ones who give the people instructions about what we understand to be the first Passover. And the details of the Passover sound like somebody's already done it, right? So, so um, you know, if you think about <laughs> um, how the people who were in Babylon are thinking about retelling these stories, it's going to be important for them to relay the fullness, to convey the fullness of that Passover experience and how it has been carried through the generations. Um, especially as they acknowledge this, this first time that the Passover is celebrated. Um, so that's before they even leave Egypt, um, while they are still um, uh, slaves. Okay, um, after Egypt, in the wilderness, but before the law is given to the people, we have Moses and Aaron acting both as priests and prophets. Um, they establish festivals. Um, they're just a, across the sea, and they establish festivals and consecration of firstborn. Uh, they are told where they can find, uh, the people are told where they can find God, present in the pillar of clouds and fire. Um, and, and Moses and Aaron convey all this to the people. Um, there, um, there's also an introduction, of, so, and, and by the way, all of those things happen before Pharaoh says, hey, stand here on the shore and let Pharaoh and his armies see you here. They'll want to come after you. Um, and it's then that we see the armies destroyed. Um, fast forward a couple of chapters to um, Exodus 17, and you hear for the first time about a guy named Joshua. Um, and uh, Joshua is called by, um, by Moses to do uh, some s small act, which is that, first of all, the people are wandering and God says, don't take them in that direction. I don't want them to have to deal with any fights with other tribes. But suddenly, um, you know, turn the page and the Amalekites are there. <laughs> and so in order to have somebody to defend them, uh, Joshua is called to, you know, is he a judge at this point? We're not told. He's not given a title. But suddenly he is acting in a way that we will later see the judges. Okay, 
And um, titles are problematic in scripture, right, for us, as we, because the lens through which we read scripture is our own modern conception of what judges are. And in the case of the Hebrew Testament, judges are warrior leaders. They are not arbiters of the law or of good you know, or morality. Okay? So Joshua appears in Exodus 17. This is only halfway through the second book in the Hebrew Testament. And he's, um, he's leading the people in um, fighting off Amalek's tribe. Okay? Um, elders are immediately brought into the picture after this. Uh, in Exodus 18, um, Moses' father-in-law, a sensitive guy named Jethro, looks at Moses and says, you are going to be exhausted if you keep this pace up. Uh, you need some help. So this is uh, one of the stories in which we hear about Moses calling for elders. Um, is this the royal priesthood? You know, is this sharing of, uh, of authority to care for God's people, is this a hint at this royal priesthood that we've, that we, that a hint is what Moses and Aaron have been about. Um, because uh, by chapter 19, all the people, not just the elders, but all the people are consecrated. Um, the theme um, breaks down at a certain point very soon after that. Um, at Sinai, Moses alone goes up the mountain. Do you remember why? The people see, uh, they see lightning and they hear thunder and they're like, we're not going up there. <laughs> right? um, so Moses goes alone and leaves Aaron down below to tend to the people and make sure that they stay on the straight and narrow. Huh. Um, so, so Moses then becomes um, identified solely with the law, and Aaron is supposed to be tending to the people. Um, you may remember how that story goes. <laughs> um, but, but what I want you to notice, though, is that titles for people matter so much less then the way that the law plays a primary role in identifying God's people in relationship to God. Um, that while we are people who think in terms of, um, of people who govern and who regulate the law, our founders thought more about how, for instance, our Constitution would define us as a people, right? And that's what, where the law becomes um, so central to God's people because whether they are governing themselves or are governed by someone else, the law continues to hold sway in their lives. Um, okay. Wilderness wanderings. Um, Moses wants to, uh, is told to avoid going in a certain direction, so God sends them in another direction um, uh, to wander through the wilderness, and that's, um, and Moses remains central then in um, both Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, but the need for elders is actually reiterated in Numbers 11. This is a passage that we get um, in our, um, in our readings of Scripture on Sunday mornings every once in a while. Often um, put side by side with some story <coughs> of the commission of the 70 that Jesus does. Um, but uh, in this particular, in Numbers 11, in this particular passage, God says, I can't do this by myself. I mean, Moses says to God, I can't do this by myself. you got to help me. So we, we hear about the, um, the elders being equipped for ministry and receiving the Spirit. It's also the story where we hear about 
Eldad and Medad, who are outside the camp, and they start to, um, to prophesy and show gifts of the Spirit, and the people are like, they don't get to have the Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this interesting clash about who gets to receive God's Spirit. Um, uh, so the, the title of elders comes back into play and will continue to be a part of that structure that helps to hold God's people together and, and that um, lifts the burden of a primary leader like Moses. Um, by the end of Deuteronomy, we hear... Uh, Deuteronomy, by the way, is um, in symbol terms, um, kind of... Uh, Moses' last will and testament. It is after a generation of people, 40 years in the wilderness means you're going to lose some people along the way, right? Um, so there's this question about the generations passing and new generations going into the land and what it means for the new generations to have any grounding in their faith in God. Um, and so, um, so Moses... Uh, takes it upon himself to give a very long sermon in Deuteronomy about all the things that they need to be ready for as they go into the land. So these are the, the 12 tribes who are going to go in and occupy the land. Um, Joshua comes up again here, and he is the heir apparent to Moses. So he's the one that we hear actually uh, sends spies into the land and ends up leading the people in their charge to march around Jericho. Um, uh, there's an interesting passage um, in Joshua, I believe it is, um, where Joshua is talking to somebody and he says something like, hey, who are you? And he's, and um, remember Joshua is a, a judge of sorts. So he, um, he is supposed to be kind of this warrior leader for the people. He sees this stranger and he says, hey, who are you? And the guy says, I'm the commander of God's army. And Joshua is thinking, wait a minute. <coughs> I'm the warrior leader. It's an interesting statement about the kind of differentiation that that um, the, tele the, the narrators of the story of the people coming into the land make about who's really in charge. Is it God or is it God's uh, appointed leaders? Um, and that becomes an issue with the ark because the people of God think that as long as they have the ark with them whenever they go out to fight, that God's going to be on their side. And they find out that that's not always the case. So this uh, encounter between Joshua and this stranger who says he's the commander of God's army ends up being this kind of sobering account of remember who's really in charge, right? That God is in charge. Uh, or we could say, as I said in my sermon today, God is king, right? Um, so in the land, we have 12 tribes. They, they occupy what we recognize as Israel, um, but they are a loose confederation of tribes. When I think about the stories that we heard during the war in Afghanistan about tribal relations and when um, the Afghan people were told that they needed to find trustworthy leaders, that one of the problems that they had was that there was so much power within the tribes that um, they needed to be very aware of how they might utilize tribal leaders because they had such strong influence. Um, the the uh, leadership of tribal leaders ends up being really important. And we, um, and we hear about those leaders, particularly in both Joshua and Judges, but Judges gives us a very interesting uh, insight into how this period of judges who were, remember, not arbiters of law or of justice, but warrior leaders, um, 
how that kind of leadership works to govern the tribes. Um, and um, Judges is likely a um, collection of different, different tribes' um, recollections of their own leaders. Um, and then put together and, um, you know, and glossed between the stories. Um, so, so in the beginning of Judges, we hear about righteous leaders like Deborah, um, who, uh, who leads the people um, and, and is faithful to God, um, and who has to get uh, the commander of the army to actually listen well to her in order that the people may be um, preserved. Um, but by the end of Judges, we're hearing about the worst <laughs> of the Judges. So it goes from pretty good to really bad. And um, of course, do you like that picture? <laughs> that picture? Um, who do you imagine that is? Samson. Samson. Right. So, um, you know, Samson is an example um, of of a leader who is willing to give up his power uh, for the love of a foreign woman. Bad on a couple of accounts, right? In, in the eyes of the Hebrew people. Um, so we, but, but we have these 12 tribes and we have judges who rule over them and lead them as they face um, the, the tribes that are already in the land. So this is a period of war, um, which means there's a lot of chaos. So probably we shouldn't be surprised to hear that there is not only, that there are not only good eggs but some corrupt leaders, right? Um, gosh, who did we just hear about in the news um, that was shot by a sniper who was a, a, a Russian lieutenant commander, uh, and he was an awful, awful man, um, had some history that was well known to American leaders. Um, in any case, the outcome of the judges um, is warfare, idolatry, banditry, treachery, rape, sanctioned kidnappings, <laughs> sacrifice of virgin daughters as a burnt offering, so misguided faith practices, right? Um, so how's that working for you, Israel, right? Um, so that's, that is the period of the judges. Um, that's where we get to um, the story that I'm preaching on today, which uh, happens in 1 Samuel, um, where um, we have Samuel, who is uh, dedicated to Eli the priest and raised in the temple but um, as a young man, when he hears the voice of God, doesn't recognize it because he really hasn't been raised in the faith in the temple. Eli's not doing his work. And, um, and evidently, Eli wasn't doing too well with raising his kids either, right? Because he has a couple of kids who are corrupt. Uh, Samuel grows, uh, gets his call from God um, uh, grows in faith and as an adult then is called to, um, to confront the people's request to have a king. Um, he is referred, just to get back to the title question, uh, Samuel is referred to at different points as he seems to be doing priestly work, but he's a judge, and, um, and he is... Um, he is supposed to be in charge of the people. But the succession plan, which would be that if you have sons, they will take over, is not one that's going to work for the people. So they actually call for a king. Um, and that's where we get the introduction of uh, kings uh, into Israel's governance. Um, the judge thing, admittedly, was not working too well. Um, but now, the, the figures that we hear about, Saul first, um, and then David and Solomon after him, have a lot of work to do because remember that these 12 tribes are loosely confederated, right? 
So this is like the colonies, you know, trying to bring the colonies together and all the questions that George Washington had to face about to how much do we include the southern colonies because we know what they're doing down there and that could be a problem and uh, do we just ignore it? Yes, I guess we ignore it for a while and then it keeps coming up as a bad problem and slavery ends up, you know, marking our history. So, so this, this confederation of tribes um, is part, that, that is the main purpose of Saul as he is raised to um, the, the uh, level of king. Um, so, uh, the passage that we're, um, it's not the actual passage that we're reading from, but in uh, 1 Samuel 10, we hear about the rights and limitations of king. Um, and the expectation, while the people expect that what they're getting is a, a national identity, the expectation is still that they are God's people. And here's where I think it's a, there's a really interesting tension that persists, uh, and, and particularly persists in um, the, the New Testament. We see it a lot as Jesus uh, butts up against authorities, and as the Jewish people find themselves trying to coexist with the Roman occupying forces. And that is, does the name Israel mean the people of God, or does the name Israel mean we are a nation with boundaries and we have sovereign rights? And the people get that confused all the time, and you could say to this day in Israel, right? Uh, you know, when I when I was there in 2009. One of the really interesting conversations I remember having with this really great guy who owned a restaurant where we had some really fine gelato was, um, was uh, he had moved from the United States back to Israel and we asked him why he felt compelled to do that and he said, because this is where God's people were chosen to be. And, and we said, so are you a practicing Jew? And he said, no. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's this, there is this strange relationship that a good portion of the citizens of Israel have to their faith, um, and to the point that um, if you've heard the term secular Zionist, yeah. you should hear that as an oxymoron. Zionism means that God's people have a God-given right to the land. Which means you need to believe that there's a God who gave that right, right? But secular means that you're really not concerned about where God is in the mix. You just want the right. <laughs> so so um, governing to this day continues to um, put those two identities in tension, right? Is Israel a nation, or is it God's people? Now, the people who are part of the diaspora, which is the people, Jewish people who are dispersed all over the globe, would say, I'm part of Israel, right? Um, it's during the period of the kings that by no accident, Prophets become absolutely essential. Um, uh, <laughs> so Samuel is also known um, in in the teaching that I received. He was known as a proto prophet. He's kind of the first of the prophets because he was the first one to establish uh, to to name a king and to support that king Saul. Uh, but he was also the first that had to butt up against the king and say, what you're doing isn't right. And one of the things uh, that, that um, Saul does, if, and it's, it was one of my children's favorite children's Bible stories, was after Samuel dies, uh, Saul is at a loss for how to proceed, and so he goes to the witch of Endor. Do you hear me witched in there? Endor. Anyway. Um, <laughs> And, and asks her to conjure up Samuel 
from the grave so that he can receive counsel. So there is this dual relationship in Israel between kings and prophets that sometimes puts the prophets and kings at odds with each other, sometimes it is simply about counsel, but pretty regularly as things proceed, they end up being at odds with the king. Um, uh, case in point, um, you know the story of Nathan coming to David and telling him the parable about the rich man who has all kinds of flocks, um, but chooses to steal his neighbor's sheep, right? Um, that parable is told to expose David's sin. Um, so there is a, pro a prophet standing up against a king who has abused his power. Um, Divided kingdom. So, oops. After, um, after uh, a united kingdom that last, lasted for about, what, 60, uh, 70 years, I think, um, there is internecine war between the north and the south. Probably aggravated by the rise of the Assyrian powers in the north, but particularly um, there is a debate over where God should be worshipped. And, um, uh, and uh, the North and the South have their own arguments about that. So they have their own kings, and they have their own priests, and they have their own prophets. Um, the priests who oversee the work of the, um, of the different temples um, uh, don't always side with the prophets. Sometimes they side with the kings against the prophets, whom God has called to um, reckon with the people's behavior. Um, national enemies become a really critical piece of the history here. Um, and the divided kingdom um, means that the northern kingdom ends up falling to Assyria first, and then the southern kingdom falls to Babylon, which means that, guess what? The people of Israel are governed by whom? foreign powers, okay? Um, and um, while there are short periods where um, they have some freedom, they first end up in uh, the southern kingdom. Um, there is 60 years in which uh, the people of Judah, who have been marched out of the land in the Babylon, are um, under Judah is under occupation, and the people who have been marched have been marched out of the land um, are being governed by a foreign power and expected to, to act as um, regularly as refugees would be seen as lesser um, citizens, if citizens at all. Um, and during the exile, that 60 years, you have children who are foreign-born, um, who have never known their home. Um, so it's kind of, the, this whole question of promised land is a remote one, but it's during this period that the people began to put all of the spices together, right? All of the stories about who they are together. Um, they are assimilated into Babylon, um, uh, but uh, they, the, the question gets raised that we find in scripture in Psalm 137, how can we sing our song in a strange land? And it's during this period that very aware of the mythologies of the foreign powers that they're under, they're like, we gotta get this stuff down so that our people know who we are and we can continue to tell our story. Um, when they return from exile, no kings allowed, right? Um, and uh, there is this sort of interesting relationship between appointed governors. Um, we hear about people, uh, these leaders being sent back into the land um, and appointed to govern their own people in Judah. Um, 
And there is always a priest of some sort who seems to be paired with that governor, um, but they do not have supreme power. They are they are given some sense of autonomy, but they they know that there is a larger power. In this case, right after the exile, it would have been Persia um, that uh, that really owned the people in the land. Um, during this period, the history is mostly absent. We don't have a lot of Hebrew scripture that tells us about what's happening. If you get into the Apocrypha, you find out about some rebellions that start to rise up as different, um, different occupiers come into the land. Um, that's my cue. Um, yeah. And, um, and that's where we uh, eventually arrive. There's a period that is accounted for in the Apocrypha that's called the Maccabean Revolt. Um, that happened in the hundreds before the Common Era. And, um, and the people, they're under this Greek um, empire that's called the Seleucids that came out of the Alexandrian Empire. Um, and they, um, they're like, hey, if we make a menace of ourselves, and the Seleucids say they're making a menace of themselves, um, let's just give them a little power in Israel, in, especially in Jerusalem, to do their own religious thing. And we got a whole, the Seleucids are like, we got a whole empire that we got to attend to, and they're really not making that much trouble. So just let them think that they're in charge. Um, at a certain point, what happens is that the people end up, um, as they're trying to figure out, the, the high priesthood becomes um, very prominent during this time um, because the care for the temple becomes a huge matter of national identity and pride. And the, um, the, um, high, pri the high priestly families get in an argument about who should be high priest. And guess who they ask to settle the argument? The Romans. <laughs> Which brings us um, to the time of Jesus. So um, that's the history that I can give you. I'm sure, um, I'm sure that Edmund could give you a much longer and more thorough version of it, but that was the down and dirty version from where <laughs> <laughs>